Toyota aftermarket upper control arms. There are many misconceptions about what they can or cannot do. The top four alleged benefits are get proper wheel alignment, clear larger tires, increase wheel travel, and increase strength. But from my experience, not all are true, or at least work the same way as you may think. So in this video, I will show you what exactly happens behind a UCA upgrade. I have three different designs to use as examples, but keep in mind, my goal is to show you the universal why and how. So in the end, you'll be equipped to make your own judgment on any designs out there. All right, let's get started. Hi, welcome to Tinker's Venture, I'm Kai. To understand aftermarket UCA, we need to first understand the function of the UCA itself. In the previous video, we learned, therefore, we attach the spindle to the frame through a lower control arm and an upper control arm. Each arm has two frame pivots that allow up and down motion, but prevent translating or tilting in other directions. They basically control the path of motion of the spindle into this one defined trajectory. That's why they are called the control arms. In addition to moving up and down, the front wheel also needs to steer left and right. That's why the upper and lower spindle attachments are both ball joints. The steering axis is an imaginary line connecting the upper ball joint to the lower ball joint. As you can see, it is not perfectly vertical. We'll come back to steering axis later. The lower control arm pivots about the frame bushings. The wheel is mounted near the outer ball joint, but the coilover is mounted somewhere in the middle. So the lower control arm acts like a lever. As you can see, there's a lot of load going through this lower control arm. That is why it is much beefier than the upper control arm. The upper control arm is mostly to keep the spindle in an upright orientation. Therefore, it experiences much less load. Now we recap the function of the UCA itself. Let's see why we may or may not want aftermarket ones. The primary function for aftermarket UCA is to get proper wheel alignment after a lift. The natural question is, how much lift will a new UCA become necessary? For this, we need to take a closer look on Toyota alignments. Like most double wishbone suspension, Toyota's upper control arm is shorter than the lower control arm. So after you lift the right height, which is the same as suspension droop, the camber on the front wheel will change slightly, and this could cause uneven tire wear. If we look at the upper control arm, the frame pivots are oriented at an angle. This is the anti-dive construction that reduces nose dive under deceleration, but there is a side effect to this construction. After lift and the suspension droops, the upper ball joint not only moves downward, but also forward which reduces caster. If we lose enough caster, we could have poor highway stability. To realign camber and caster, we can adjust the lower control arm cam bolts. By trigonometry, the combination of front and rear adjustments can move the lower ball joint in and out of the frame, affecting camber, and also front to rear, affecting caster. The front and rear cam adjustments do have slightly different roles, but practically speaking, both camber and caster are affected simultaneously. So oftentimes, the alignment process is a balancing game between caster and camber. After a small lift, we need to shift the lower ball joint forward, recovering some caster. At the same time, try to keep the camber in spec. These frame pivots do have a limited range of movements, so with enough lift, you can run out of adjustments. And this is when aftermarket UCA is needed. As you can see, the aftermarket one positioned the upper ball joint further backwards, adding positive caster through the upper control arm. Therefore, we need less adjustment from the lower control arm. Now the question is, with factory UCA, how much lift does it take to max out those adjustments? I attempted to quantify this, but realized two caveats. First, the front to rear levelness of the frame will affect caster. This is because the caster angle is measured between the steering axis and vertical to ground, not relative to the frame. As the levelness of the frame changes, the steering axis tilts with it, directly affecting caster. This is one reason why sometimes people with the same amount of front lift can have very different alignment results, because their rear lift is different. The second caveat is, with different amount of lift, the balancing game between camber and caster is different. And oftentimes, you cannot utilize the full range of adjustments due to this balancing game. There are just too many variables for a clean cut answer. Nevertheless, if we overgeneralize, a rough rule of thumb is about two inch lift is where you start to need new UCA for alignment. Here, I want to clear up another common confusion. Many people ask something like this. I want to lift about three inches, but I'm just gonna use spacers. Do I still need new upper control arm? 
Or how about I just gonna use new springs or full replacement coilovers? The truth is, how you achieve the lift doesn't matter. Only the amount of lift matter. The alignment is basically the spatial orientation of the spindle, which is solely controlled by the position of the upper and lower ball joint. What you install in the coil bucket to set the ride height doesn't really matter. It's the final ride height itself that counts. Now, if you lift two inches or less and achieve proper wheel alignment through factory UCA, are there other benefits to upgrade the UCA anyway? Hmm, keep watching to the end and you'll find out. Hey, I want to take a moment and share something really cool happened to this channel. I've been wearing this Walls insulated overall through many cold Pennsylvania winters. It kept me warm and clean when I tinker in the garage. And turn out, a friend at Walls is also a Toyota enthusiast and he really enjoyed my videos. So Walls decided to send me some cool new gears and support what I do. I would like to thank Walls for supporting this channel. Now, if you also like to get dirty and tinker with your truck, make sure to check out Walls Outdoor Workwear through the link in the description. Everyone's trying to fit those 33s and 35s and clear the body mount area. You probably heard the statement that a high caster pushes the tire forward. However, there are a lot of misinterpretation about this statement. If not done correctly, a high caster can actually decrease body mount clearance. Let's take a closer look. To increase caster, we can move the lower ball joint forward, which also moves the tire forward. From my measurement, the maximum you can move is about half an inch. However, with high caster UCA, they move the upper ball joint backwards, so they actually move the tire closer to the body mount. Therefore, the caster angle is not your goal. It is simply a side effect. Many UCAs add too much so that we didn't even need to shift the lower control arm forward. Or worse, we may even need to adjust it backwards just to achieve proper caster and camber. Here's a bad example from one of my viewers. He had to run 5.2 degrees of caster just to clear 33 inch tires, even with the body mount chop. And worse, he had to make some sacrifice on camber and was having uneven tire wear. I also had the personal experience with the Ironman Pro Forge UCA installed on the GX460. On Ironman's website, it claims four degrees of caster corrections. That sounds a little too much for the reason we just went over. But with my rough measurements, it only adds about two degrees. That is a lot more ideal. Nevertheless, with the amount of lift we have, the tire could not be pushed forward at all due to the balancing game between camber and caster. It was pretty much set at the factory neutral position. We did get excellent alignment results, which means this UCA achieved its primary functions perfectly. The lower control arm doesn't need any adjustment at all, but this means you are not getting the best body mount clearance. For the objective of pushing the tire forward, adjustable UCAs like the SPC can come in handy. Instead of adding a fixed amount of caster like other brands, oftentimes too much, the offset ball joint allow various caster settings for different lift height. You can set the minimum viable caster on the UCA and let the lower control arm do most of the work recovering caster, which at the same time will push the tire forward. Another key benefit to this is the sliding channel, which allow camber adjustment independent from caster. This is huge because this eliminates the balancing game. Therefore, SPC in theory, allows the absolute maximum tire clearance and still maintain good alignment angles. However, not all regular shops will touch the adjustable UCAs. Even if they do, they may not know enough to actually align for maximum clearance. Over the years, as 4x4 become more and more popular, this become less of an issue. But you should always make sure your shop know exactly what you're looking for. A simpler but more elegant solution is AccuTune Offroad's new design. This is an engineering prototype I borrowed for this video, so I do have to send it back. I had the honor to chat with their engineer Ryan to talk about their design philosophy. Although this is a simple fixed ball joint design, the camber and caster is strategically optimized for tire clearance on a two and a half inch lift. You can bring it to any alignment shop and the UCA geometry will naturally push the lower control arm forward. Ryan told me one of their objectives is to clear 33 inch tires without a body mount chop. I did not have the opportunity to install this on the vehicle to verify, but through our technical discussions, I'll take his word for it. In addition to the body mount, wider tires like the 285s can interfere with the factory UCA. This is because the factory stamp design has a lot of bulk in front of the ball joint. This forces one to run more negative offset wheels or add a wheel spacer. If you already plan to do this for a wider stance, then it doesn't really matter. But for those who are still undecided, 
Wheel offset have a significant impact on body mount clearance. I measure with the one and a quarter inch wheel spacer, we lose over half inch of body mount clearance. Easily cancels out the maximum clearance you gain from alignment. So something to think about. Most aftermarket UCAs, like the three here, has more clearance around the ball joint. This is nice to have, especially for even wider tires like the 305s or 315. However, there are aftermarket UCAs that have similar or even worse bulk than factory. If you don't like running too much wheel offset, Make sure you do your research. Adding wheel travel is often advertised as a feature of aftermarket UCA. There are two common misconceptions about this. First, for late model Toyotas, the maximum up travel is limited by the bump stop. The maximum down travel is limited by the length of the shock. Both are irrelevant to the UCA. So by just changing the UCA itself, you won't realize any more travel. But by changing to slightly longer coilovers, you will gain some down travel. Some companies market these as extended travel coilovers and claim they require aftermarket UCAs with high articulation ball joint. And this is the second misconception or even misinformation. At least for the late model Toyotas, other vehicle can be different. I found the factory UCA would not bind with off the shelf extended travel coilovers. I made a video specifically for extended travel or mid travel setups. I will link it at the end of this video and won't digress further now. Both Ironman and AccuTunes use its factory size ball joint. Some manufacturers like the SPC develop proprietary high articulation ball joint. However, there is an interesting plot twist I discovered. When compared side by side, the Ironman UCA achieved more droop than the SPC, despite having a smaller ball joint. This is because Ironman mount the ball joint at an angle, whereas SPC's ball joint is perpendicular to the arm, probably for ease of manufacturing. Therefore, starting at right height, the SPC ball joint is already more articulated. The factory ball joint is also mounted at an angle, just not as much as the Ironman. So in the end, SPC only achieves slightly more droop than factory. The more interesting part is, Ironman didn't even mention allowing more droop on their website, which makes sense because UCA is not the limiting factor to begin with. On the other hand, SPC used high articulation as a key marketing point. In the end, droop is limited by the coilover, and all four UCAs here, including the factory one, will achieve the same result. What I'm getting at is there are many things that don't work the same way as you were told. So for us consumer, it is key to understand the principles and mechanism. Another related item is the UCA clearance around the coil spring. Some believe the UCA will hit the larger coilovers with extended travel. Here I have a Fengxiao Pro coilover, which have a 2.7 inch shock body diameter. It also adds 1.2 inch of extra droop. That is larger diameter and more travel than most other options out there. The factory UCA is very close to the coil spring, but still not touching. Ironman also doesn't require running new UCAs with these coilovers. I have seen upper control arm hitting the coil happen, but most of them are due to adding a tall strut tall spacers that overextend the droop. This also includes adding just the thin spacers on top of an already extended travel coilover. There are just a lot of variables and you rarely get a full story from the internet. There could be legit interference I didn't know about, such as due to vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle variation. Nevertheless, I didn't observe this interference in my measurement. Most aftermarket UCAs create more opening around the coilover. Some advertise this as a must-have feature, but I personally feel it's a little bit of a stretch. Especially in the 4x4 world, it is easy to blindly seek a strength upgrade without considering the context. As mentioned previously, all the vertical loads go through the lower control arm. The upper control arm just keeps the spindle upright. The force on the upper control arm goes in line with the arm and is mostly compression. These forces are a result from the offset distance between the wheel and the lower ball joint. As you can see, these two offset forces try to tilt the top of the spindle inwards. To resist this tilt, the upper control arm will supply a horizontal force component. And this force component can be calculated by the wheel force times this offset distance divided by the spindle height. Toyota IFS has a very tall spindle, which is good at minimizing the load on the UCA. And from the force equation, you can see the more negative wheel offset you have, the more load will be on the UCA. And that is one reason why most factory wheel has very positive wheel offset, so that it can minimize the load on the UCA. And sure, the factory UCA does look kind of weak, but in my opinion, it is adequate for this type of load case. I have yet to see a bent factory UCA simply from hard use, but I have personal experience and seen many bent UCA long bolt. I have also seen quite a few factory spindle getting bent. So my take is, 
any UCA design is more than strong enough. If you are seriously hardcore, doing the well-done UCA double shear bracket and the well-done spindle gusset is a higher priority because those are the weakest link. I don't deny some fancy constructions do look cool in the wheel well, but you should be clear, those will not achieve a higher overall strength. Some people may think the factory ball joint is weak, but almost all ball joint failure were due to negligence of running out of grease. The ball got rusted, worn out of the socket, so it eventually popped out. But the ball joint will show sign of looseness and noise for a good amount of time before actual failure. The exact same failure mode had happened to a lot of bigger and stronger ball joints when they are not properly maintained. In a properly set up suspension, if you manage to break a factory ball joint with pure brute force, chances are a lot of other components will be broken at the same time. So unless your chassis is highly reinforced and you are doing actual off-road racing, an OE ball joint will be more than strong enough. Strengthening a single component without the context of the whole vehicle is meaningless. In our examples, both Ironman and AQ2 off-road use OE replacement ball joints, which means a Toyota part or replacement ball joints like the Moog Problem Solver will all fit. Those ball joints have proven reliability and you can easily source replacement parts. Now going back to an earlier question, if you are only running a small lift and you manage to get good alignment through factory UCA, are there still benefits for an UCA upgrade? In my opinion, not much. With a small lift and factory UCA, as you try to recover Kessler through alignment, the lower control is naturally pushed forward a little bit which help with the body mount clearance. If you run a high caster UCA with low lift, you will for sure lose body mount clearance. We also went over for late model Toyotas. Neither wheel travel or overall strength is limited by the UCA. So for most people, you won't actually realize any performance gain. However, if you have more lift and need a new UCA for alignment, then there are more things to consider. Other than the functional stuff we talked about, the constructions and maintenance are equally important. How should you choose the optimal design for your particular needs? We will go over that in the next video. I will also make my personal recommendations among these three designs for different types of build. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.